Well, we're going to come to our scripture reading. If Mary will come up, and our Bible reading is from the Epistle of Titus. That comes after First and Second Timothy, then Titus, uh, chapter two, verses one to verse fifteen. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then you can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled, and everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose, they may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try and please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they will be fully trusted, so that in every way they will be make the teaching about our God, Saviour, attractive. For the grace of God has appeared and offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godless life in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are very own, eager to do what is good. These then be the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Amen. Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, breathe a word of prayer as we come to the scripture. Father, we come to your word. We thank you you didn't leave us without instructions. And Lord, we only need to turn the pages of the Holy Writ to understand what is the right way. Forgive us, Lord, if we have gone our own way. Try to do it our way. And bring us back, Lord, as an emerging church in Bergedi, to follow the Maker's instructions. And, Lord, to do what is right in your sight and in your eyes. We pray this for the glory of God and for Jesus Christ's name, that it may sound abroad in the community in which we live and beyond. We ask this in his holy name. Amen. Well, we have been singing quite a few hymns about the blood of Jesus this afternoon, and uh, I don't know that Beverly didn't know what my subject was. Uh, Either I think I had told her, we also have had the Lord's table, which is a focus on Jesus' body being broken and his blood being shed. Now, as I did hint at the start of the service, we did have a meeting last night, and we had people here who had a wrong understanding of how to obtain salvation. They had been going the way that you would think would be the right way. They went to religions and people who were in churches uh, of some description, but somehow they missed out on what is the gospel. What is the gospel? When we read this passage, which is an instruction manual to a young man called Titus in the island of Crete, and as you know, the Apostle Paul was an, he was an apostle, in so much he was a groundbreaker. He was used of God to go about in the known world and to break ground for the gospel. Using great wisdom, often in strategic places, he initiated the church and churches. He was a called out man to do this. But he had to leave people behind to establish the work and to set things up according to the way they should be. And he gives Titus uh, some instructions about how to teach the people about their lifestyles, about their living. 
And what is expected of them now that they are in the body of Christ? And there are expectations. The world has expectations. You do something shady or disputable in front of your work colleagues and you'll hear the whispers and he calls himself a Christian. He calls himself a Christian. So what we actually have here is what some churches have interpreted as the gospel. Living a good life to get yourself into heaven. And that is not the gospel. It is, however, appropriate to the gospel that we so live. If we read verse 1, You, however, Titus, listen to me, Titus, I'm leaving you behind, Titus, this emerging church in Crete here. I'm telling you, it's uh, an affirmative, it's a must. You must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And I'll be frank, I sometimes go to churches, listen to sermons, listen to meetings, and they're good. They're wonderful. They're clever. Oh, they, they're so, you know, how could that man come up with so much knowledge, so much understanding? And But what I often say to myself, is it appropriate what the man is teaching? Because if the word of God is not put into effect, it doesn't matter how tidy your sermon is, how clever it is, how much... You think of yourself in your delivery of whatever it is. If what you're actually saying to the person is not appropriate, then it's not appropriate. When we talk to people in normal day-to-day -day life, we don't talk to them so they give us marks out of ten as to what they think about us. We talk to them usually for a purpose. If I say to my daughter, it's time you made your bed, I've got a purpose behind it. My teaching has got an appropriateness about it. I don't talk about the philosophy of a lifestyle. We have a real, an end objective in view. And so we have with the gospel. There is an appropriateness in how we live and how we teach. And we have to teach appropriately. So if you look at verse 1, you must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And then for an emerging church, you've got to be on the ball and teach what is meant, what the people need to hear. Not what is beyond them, or beneath them, or is not appropriate. And this is, to me, is basic. The plain things are the main things, and the main things are the plain things. There's no point in teaching a, a man who's not saved about baptism and sanctification. He has first to come to the cross. That is our unique selling point. I mentioned about the people last night who had struggled through religions to find God. They were looking for God. The whole three of them that stood on this platform last night were all looking for God for years. They were looking for God. Some in churches. But what they were doing was not appropriate. They were doing good works. They were adhering to what was expected of them according to the religions that were put in front of them or what they were born into. But they were not bringing peace with God. Thank God as a gospel church, we put the gospel first. The simplicity of the gospel must always be brought first. And when we read this passage, you however must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And then he finishes up in verse 15, these then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Don't chicken out, Titus. Teach these things to these Christians who have come to Christ. And the bit in between is the meat on the sandwich that we're going to look at for a moment. But when we get to verse 11, he tells us this is not a gospel, this is appropriate to the gospel. In verse 11 it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I don't know what the Jehovah's Witnesses do with that verse. They, they don't reckon that Jesus is God, and yet it's hitting you there in the face. We're looking for the appearing of the, great, of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our great God. It's there in black and white. Who gave himself for us to redeem us 
from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now that's the gospel. The gospel is in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. The gospel is in the faith that is born in us that looks for an expected end that we have an appe- the appearing of his glory, our great God. And we, uh, the, the eagerness is that we are purified after we become Christians to do what is good and say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. Jesus said to the, to the people, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no wise enter into the kingdom. The outworking of grace produces righteousness. And he's teaching them in their culture, which at the time was a pagan culture in, in Crete. He starts with the old men, the old women, the young women, the young men, and then the servants, and he teaches them certain things. Let's look at them quickly. Verse 2, it says, Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Now, he's talking to old guys like me. You've got to be temperate. You've got to have... You're not into drink, in the sense that you're losing your reputation. You've got to be worthy of respect. Worthy of respect. Now, I was a school teacher. Another school teacher friend, she used to say to the pupils, Listen, young man, you've got to earn your respect. She used to start with your kind of song to the kids. You've got to earn your respect. She had a thing about that, you know, about they all wanted their rights. She said, oh, rights come with responsibilities. And you've got to earn your respect. You know, they would tell you when something wasn't fair, when something wasn't right, when something was done against them, they would complain. But she would say, you've got to earn your respect. If you want people to respect you, you've got to live in a manner that calls out for respect. If you're a rude person, a bad-mannered person, if you're someone that turns your back on someone and dismisses them, don't expect them to respect you. You've got to live a life, old guy that you are, with self-respect and with respect for others. Not to make you a Christian. He's already told us that. But because it's appropriate to sound doctrine, the teaching will bring this out in you. And the the key word that comes out in this passage is self-control. Be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. We need these qualities. We need to love people. We need to endure. We need stamina and a spiritual stamina. We need to be sound in our faith, spend our time with the Lord so that it's reinforced in us because we have been with Jesus. And that's what they said about the disciples. They, they marveled that they had been with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus, it has a rub-off effect. A rub-off effect. I spent a lot of time an entrepreneur in Ireland. I'll tell you, it had a rub-off effect on me. I watched him seize opportunities. I watched him turn a, a, something that others would have walked by and turn it into a massive opportunity. And I saw what he was doing. And it rubbed off on me. And that's on the human level. If you spend time with Jesus, it will rub off with you. Praise God. So we've got to be self-controlled. Likewise, in the same vein, if you went, verse 3, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Eileen was remarking to me the other day, you know, we always have a stereotypical picture of an older lady that she's kind, you know, we used to talk about the, oh, I better not mention that, it's, I might get struck off or something. But they used to talk about certain ladies who presented an image, and you always expect them to speak a certain way and to be gracious and kind, because that's what old ladies are. But she'd been looking at these old ladies the other day, and she was listening to their language. They were effing and blinding and seeing and full of anger, hate, bitterness, and that was only and shouting across the road. And they weren't the young things. They were old ladies. 
I said, well, what do you expect? Maybe in a previous generation, the older ladies had a different value system. But when you think, they've been going like this for 40, 50, 60 years, just because they got old doesn't make them into genteel, caring grannies. But the Word of God does. And being old doesn't imply in this generation that you are reverent in the way you live. You revere things. You give people respect. And uh, that you're not a slanderer. You know, as a gossiper, you bring somebody down by a remark that cuts them down. You know, words have power. The story goes that this fella spread a reputation, a story about uh, a fella having an affair with another woman. And that story went all round the place. And it turned out it wasn't true. And uh, the person that had started the story, it was actually a Jewish story, he went to the rabbi and he confessed. He said, I'm very sorry. I've been talking about a guy and I've spread gossip about this guy. And I really thought it was true, but it turned out it wasn't true. He said, what should I do? He said, well, I'll show you what to do. She said, Take that pillar slip up to the top floor of the building. And he cut it. He cut the top off it and he started shaking the feathers to the four corners of the earth into the wind. He says, what are you doing? He says, well, you want to repair the damage you've done. He says, go and pick up all the feathers. He says, how can I do that? He says, they've been... Blown to the four corners of the earth. He says, well, that's what happens with your stories. When you tell something about someone and you slander someone. And so it's so important that, uh, I'm not saying that it's women that gossip. I'm sure men get a lot of gossip. But the old ladies were told not to be slanderers. Maybe it was common in their culture. Not to be addicted to much wine. and But to teach what is good. So we're looking for a lifestyle which is superior, which people respect, and they know that they are safe in their company. They know their reputation safe in their company. They know that they are regarded as being someone of worth. Respect means that you regard people of worth. I remember Raymond McEwen, we had an open air meeting in Glasgow, and I remember Raymond. And people loved Raymond because he was a people's man. He had respect for everyone. And the ordinary working class folk used to preach at the working at the gates of the shipyards. They all respected him. Now some people preach in the open air and they thunder judgment on people. They warn them of the doom of hell. And they'll do it from a high up platform looking down on them. And, but not Raymond. Raymond spoke to them at their level. And this fella started uh, coming into the circle because we played lively music at our open airs. And this old drunk down and out started dancing in the middle of the circle. And all the people, there were big crowds at these open airs in these days, started laughing at the man and he was enjoying the attention. So he got more enthusiastic in his dancing. As he mocked him and scorned at him, he misinterpreted it as applause. But they were actually making a fool of the man. And Raymond stopped the music. He said, now listen, every one of you. He said, I don't care how far a man falls in the gutter. I'm going to tell you all, that man was made in the image of God. The, the stamp of God is in that man, and you should never look down on another man. Christ died for us all. And the people took it from Raymond, because they knew that he cared. They knew that he cared. And so these image of lifestyles that we have to put on for old men and old women. And then, of course, it passes on to the younger women in verse 4. <coughs> then they can urge the younger women. If you don't live right, how are you going to tell the young women how to live? If you as an older woman don't cut the cloth, then, only then, when your example is there, can you reinforce it with words. Somebody said once, preach the gospel. And use words if necessary. Let your example speak because you're representing 
the Lord Jesus Christ. They can urge the young women to be self-controlled. Here it comes again. And pure. To be busy at home. To be kind and to be subject to the husband. So that no one will malign the word of God. The family life is in order. The examples are good. And we are representing a saviour. And this is Titus's job as he helps this emerging church. So a simile encourages the young men to be self-controlled. And everything set them an example by doing what is good. People don't listen to your words. They look to your example. They look at what you do. They look at how you live. They sense, do you care about them? And do you respect them? And if they get the negative vibes, you can reason to the cows come home, but it won't cut the cloth. In your teaching, show integrity and seriousness. Integrity means it's true to you as well. You live what you say, and you say what you live. We have to be self-controlled. Self-controlled is the key in this passage. Set them an example by doing what is good. Help them to see that you're doing good things. In your teaching, show integrity and seriousness. Remember Sandy Rogers at his retirement from a church? His closing message to the whole congregation was, I am leaving you. For all the years I have served you, I have taught you to take your faith seriously. Take it seriously. And that was his, his swan song. Be serious about your faith. And soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. They can't cast it back on you. Everything you've said is tested and sound. You don't need to be ashamed because they've got nothing bad to say. They can't dig the dirt on you. Not even in your theology. We must be sound in our speech. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything. To try to please them, not to talk back to them. Not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. Now we know in the culture of the day, they were under the occupation of the Romans and Roman slavery, quite different from African slavery, was a, a lifestyle. Now the Bible's not creating an anti-slavery protest song here. It's meeting people where they are. If you are a slave, then this is how you have to live as a Christian now. First a slave to Christ. You have to be trusted. You have to please your masters and not talk back to them. You have not to steal from them. You have to show that you can be trusted. So that in every way, the teaching about our God, our Saviour, they will say, what is different about that one? You have made it attractive. Our lifestyles must make the gospel attractive. So you see, that is not the gospel. But in churchianity, that is the gospel. In churchianity, you live the life, you do the good things, and then you go to heaven because you've been a good person. But the Bible is so clear that that is not the gospel. It is appropriate to the gospel. You don't call on the Lord to be saved and then live like the devil. It only echoes that grace has not been effective in you. Because if grace has been effective in you, you are eager to serve the Lord. Eager to serve the Lord. Christ giving himself for us is the essence of the gospel. That is where we start and where we stop. And we should always reach people appropriately. If they're not converted, all our theology, all our eschatology, all our soteriology, it's not appropriate until the man or the woman has bowed the knee to Jesus. Praise God for the Bible studies we're going to have. We believe that salvation through faith in Christ, who according to the scripture, died for our sins, was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day, and that through his blood we have redemption. Praise God, that's the gospel. I had a, a dear old friend, Alvin Pearson, he was an AOG pastor, a lovely, godly, gracious, kind man. The thought of one that, this, that Titus could say, well, this fella meets the bill here. He used to give out gospel tracts. He always had them in his pocket. When he went on to a bus and he showed the bus driver his bus pass, he also would stand and speak to the man and look into his eyes 
and give him a gospel tract and see why he was giving it to him. And he took his time to do it. And he, he, he kind of looked at me because he knew that I like giving out gospel tracts. He said, well, Jim, let me look at your tracts. I said, why are you going to do that, Alwyn? I want to check if it's really a gospel tract. I said, what do you mean? It's been printed by the Evangelical Alliance. Let me read it. Yes, that one is a gospel tract. No, that's not a gospel tract. Yes, this is a gospel tract. And what he meant was he was looking in the tract for the essential components of what the gospel is. Because you get gospel tracts that tell people to come to Jesus. You get gospel tracts that tell people to trust the Lord. But when you actually read the tract, it says nothing about what I just uh, read to you there. We believe in salvation through faith in Christ, who according to the scripture died for our sins, was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day, and through his blood we have redemption. That it's the gospel. And if that is missing, you've not got a gospel tract. The gospel is in the fact of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that's why we need the Bible study. I'm taking a funeral on Wednesday and I looked up the church to see what kind of church it was. And I didn't read anything about the blood of Christ anywhere. I read some of the messages about God wants us to have fun. Uh, I read something about uh, they don't have Bible studies, they have uh, seekers and searchers. Now to me, that's opening a dangerous door. Because you're now, where do you seek and search? Do you start going into the Quran? Do you start going into the relevant thinking of the day? Why don't we call a spade a spade? You study the Bible because it is the word of God. The word of God. And you don't seek and search. That's what these people were doing last night on this platform. They told us for years they were seeking and searching. But only when they found the cross, the glory of the cross, did the peace of God come upon them. And the Bible says, For the grace of God has appeared to offer salvation to all people. We read that in our passage, Titus chapter 2 verse 11. If you go to the next chapter, it says, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, so that's, uh, that's hammered the churchianity doctrine. He saved us, let me read that again, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. John, the gospel tells us, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, a new birth. That part of you inside which is dead to God your spirit, for God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, has to be made alive again. And it can only be made alive by God's Holy Spirit when we are redeemed, when we are washed with the blood of Jesus in the sense that God takes our sins away. And we have been justified by grace that we might become, he of, become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. And Paul says, what I received... And we read it in the communion service as well. I passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so we could go into a good Bible study here, but uh, I'll get into trouble if I do that. But we have so many verses according to the scriptures which show us what the gospel is. Let's never leave behind the gospel. Never. The Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. Have a look at your feet. Check them out. Are they beautiful feet? Are they feet that carry the gospel to men and women? How simple to say to someone, listen, if you want to go to heaven, the gospel is not good works, being a good person. The gospel is Jesus died on the cross, according to the scriptures, to the penalty of our sins, and he rose from the dead to defeat hell, death, and the grave, and he gave us a gospel that all who repent of their sins and put their trust in the finished work of Christ will be redeemed. And the Bible says, those that call upon him, call in the name of the Lord, shall be saved. You tell somebody that, you've got beautiful feet. You've got beautiful feet. You could discuss Isaiah. You could discuss 
all sorts of stuff, what's going to happen at the end of the world, but that's not the gospel. The good living reinforces the gospel. Live the Christian life and add weight to what you're telling people. Now, if you don't live the Christian life and you try to tell people to get saved, they will read something else from the message. It's appropriate that we live a certain way, a lifestyle that reinforces the gospel. So, praise God as we get into Bible study. I think it's wonderful. And praise God that we have a gospel. And it's a true gospel that men and women can rejoice when the sins fall off their back and they are, their spirit comes alive to God and they have found the Lord again. Praise God. Now, Beth's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn. And then we will... I'm going to ask if Heather would just close in prayer after Bev sings. Oh, <laughs> Stand if you want, just, just you want stretch your legs there and worship you, and worship the Lord. I worship you.
And that good news we need to confess, we need to share with other people. And so we thank, we thank you for who you are. We bring you our thanks and our worship and our praise because you are worthy. And we are not. But we thank you that you didn't just leave us. You gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we go out into the week, that we will go knowing that our sin is forgiven. Yes. That we will go knowing that we have a God in heaven who loves us. Mm -hmm. And that we have good news to share with the people that we will meet this week. Father, take us out into the week with those feet that will uh, take us to people and places to share about you. And we ask it, Lord, not for any good works of ourselves, but that you may be given the glory because you are worthy in Jesus' name.